I'm going to show you seven best practices for using Serilog in ASP.NET Core. Serilog is a structured logging library that you can use to implement robust logging support in your applications, and I'm going to show you how to get the most out of it. We're going to start by installing Serilog in our application. So for that, I'm going to look for the Serilog library. I'm not going to install the base Serilog library. I'm actually going to choose the Serilog ASP.NET Core package because it has better integration with our framework. So now that we have Serilog installed, let's see how to set it up. And this is the first advice that I want to give you, and that is using your application settings to configure Serilog. So you're going to say builder host use Serilog, and then you want to configure the logger using your application settings. So I'm going to provide a delegate accepting my logger configuration, and I'm going to say logger config read from configuration, and then I can use the host builder context to provide my iConfiguration instance. This is going to look for a configuration set section in my application settings with the name of Serilog. Now that section doesn't exist and I'm actually going to replace the default logging section with a Serilog section which is going to help me configure my console logger to start out. Configuring Serilog using the application settings has a few advantages. First of all, we can easily define different configurations for different environments. This could mean using different syncs or log levels per environment and we can configure all of this without redeploying the application. All we have to do is change the application settings. The next important thing is configuring your minimum log level for your application logs. I set everything to information, so anything under this level will not be included in our application logs, and everything at or above this level, which includes warning, error, and critical logs, is going to be included. You need to decide which log level is appropriate for production use, and you can even consider placing the default log level to warning for production, and you can bring it down to information or even debug if at any point you need to get more information out of your logs. Another amazing feature that Serilog has is the concept of enrichers. Serilog enrichers help you add additional information to your application logs. For example, I can include the machine name and the current thread ID in all of my application logs and the from log context enricher allows me to push properties into a log context which is something that I can define with a given scope. For example, a log context could live during an HTTP request and I can push some valuable information into that log context, which I'm going to show you in just a moment. But before that, I want to configure one more thing, and that is Serilog request logging. This is a custom middleware from Serilog that's going to hook into the HTTP request pipeline, and you can turn it on by saying use Serilog request logging. This middleware will give you valuable information about your API requests at the start and end of each request. It's going to collect all the important pieces of information together and write them as a single log statement, which is why I like using Serilog request logging but this isn't enough for everything that we're going to need so I'm going to create a new middleware folder where I'm going to include my custom middleware. I'm going to add a new class inside that I will call the request log context middleware and let's define our custom middleware. So I'm going to inject a request delegate from the constructor and I'm going to call it next with the request delegate in place. I can now write my invoke async method. This is a public method returning a task. It's called invoke async and it has one argument which is the HTTP context. Inside of this method, I'm going to use the log context enricher that I mentioned earlier. And here's how you can do it. You'll say log context, and this will let me create a log context that's going to live during my HTTP request. And I want to push a custom property inside that's going to be called the correlation ID. The value for the correlation ID will come from my HTTP context, and I'm going to take the trace identifier as the value of this property. The trace identifier is a unique value that I can use to represent this API request in my application logs. So how am I going to use it? Well, I'm just going to define it in my log context, and then I can just say return next and give it the context value. So the purpose of this custom middleware is pushing the correlation ID property into the log context, which will make it available for my structured logs anywhere inside of this context, which is the lifetime of our HTTP request. I'm going to show you how we're going to use this a bit later. The next thing we need to do is to include this middleware in the request pipeline. So let's do it before adding the Serilog request logging. 
So I'm going to say use middleware and I'm going to specify the request log context middleware. What we have so far takes care of the high level setup for server log, but what about our application logs? Well, because I'm using mediator in this application, I can use mediator's pipeline behavior to introduce a logging pipeline. So that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to add a new class inside and I will call it the request logging pipeline behavior. This will be a generic class with a T request and a T response argument. It's going to implement the I pipeline behavior interface and specify the generic arguments. But I'm also going to define some generic constraints. I'm going to say that the T request is a class and the T response for this pipeline is a result object. And I made sure that this is in place when configuring my messaging abstractions. So all of my commands and queries return a result object back, which is why I can use this generic constraint inside of my pipeline behavior. The next thing we obviously need is an iLogger to start logging our requests. So I'm going to inject an iLogger of request pipeline logging behavior and let's specify the generic arguments in the context. I'm going to call this the logger and let's initialize this from the constructor. And then inside of the handle method, we're going to log before and after executing our request. So let's make this asynchronous because we're going to need the request handler's delegate result. And I'm going to start by capturing the request name, which is going to come from my T request type. So I'm going to say type of T request and then give me the name of this type. This will help me identify which command or query I am currently executing. So let's start with a simple information log. I'll say log information. I want to say that I'm processing a request with a given name. Now I can specify the name of this request using a structured log property. When I type the request name like this inside of curly braces in my log statement, it's going to be converted into a structured log property. But I also need to provide a value for this property. And this is where my request name comes in. Then we can go ahead and execute our request. So I'm going to say T response, which is our result object, and we can just execute our delegate. And then depending on if this is a success or a failure result, I probably want to have different logs. So let's say if this is a success result, I'm going to log an information log and I'm going to say completed request. I'll again say request name and I already have the value in the request name variable. However, if this isn't a success result, then I'm going to add a different log statement to describe the failure. Now you can decide which log level you want to use for this, depending on how frequently you expect your commands or queries to fail. For example, I want to use the error log level in this case, and I'm going to say completed request, and then the request name as our structured log property with error. So let's specify the request name. And what do we do about the error? You could also specify it as another structured log property. So for example, I could write it like this and then pass in the error from my result object, which I have access to. However, if I specify it like this, it's going to be converted into a string by calling result error to string. I can also destructure this into a JSON object by placing the at sign in front of the error. And this will allow me to filter my structure logs based on the contents of the error object. However, it's going to make my logs unnecessarily verbose. So there's a slightly better alternative that I'm going to show you now, and I'm not going to be logging the request error at all. What I'm going to do is use the log context from Serilog. So we can define a very minimal log context. So I'll say log context, and I don't have access to Serilog in the application project. So I'm going to install the Serilog library. And now I can add my using statement and I can say log context push property. And let's call this property the error. I'll give it the result error value. And then it's important to specify true to destructure this into a JSON object. And then I'm going to move my error log inside of this log context. And now I can just return my result and complete my pipeline behavior. So this is going to take care of logging the success and failure of every command and query in our application, but I also need to configure it with mediator. So let's add this before the query caching pipeline behavior. I'm going to say add open behavior, and then I need to say type of 
request logging pipeline behavior. And one more best practice that I think you should use is using Seek while in local development. I can introduce Seek using a Docker container and I'm going to configure it in my Docker Compose setup. Seek is a structured logging server and I can connect it with Serilog to ingest my application logs. I'm going to spin up the data last Seek image inside of a Docker container when running my application. It's going to be exposed on the port 5341. I'm also going to expose the Seek dashboard on this port to be able to access it through my browser. And while this is enough to spin up a Docker container with a Seek instance running inside, I still need to connect this with Serilog. So for this, I'm going to look for a sync. Serilog syncs give you a way to write the Serilog logs into various services, for example, Application Insights or Datadog, but we're going to be using the Seek Serilog Sync to write our application logs into the Seek instance that is running inside of a Docker container. All I need to do to make this work is just update my application settings. And this is another reason why I like to use the application settings approach to configure Serilog. I need to tell Serilog to use the Seek Sync and then I also need to tell it to write to this sync by adding the configuration in the Write To section this is going to point to the Seek server URL, which is going to be exposed on this port internally inside of the Docker network. But if you take a closer look, this is just the name of my container, and this is the port that I configured Seek to be exposed on. And now let me show you the results of everything that we did so far. First, I'm going to send a few requests to our API to trigger some application logs to be written. So let me send this a few more times. Then I'm going to send a post request that's going to succeed on the first attempt and then fail a few more times. And now let's move over into the Seek dashboard. This is the Seek dashboard running on the 8081 port, which is what we configured in our Docker Compose setup. And you can see a lot of application logs being written here. So let's take a look at this log where we completed a request, the create user command with an error. You can see that it contains an error property inside, which is our error object containing the error code, the description, and what is the type of this error. It also has the correlation ID that we pushed in our correlation ID middleware. And what I can do with this is take this correlation ID value and filter my logs based on the correlation ID. And this allows me to see all of my application logs for a particular request. And now I can trace this request through my application. So you can see I'm executing an endpoint. Then there's a log in our pipeline behavior that we started processing the command. Here's a log from EF core of the SQL query that we executed. And then we run into an error. I can see which error this is. And finally, I'm returning a 409 response from my API. You can also see information about how long it took to execute this request. If I go back to the default view, let's take a look at our query. I can go through all of my logs to look for this query, or I can search for it using the request name, which is the name I assigned in my pipeline behavior. And let's look for the get user by ID query. So if I filter by this request name, I'm going to see the free queries that I sent, and then I can decide which one I want to see more information for and take the correlation ID, for example, and then search by the correlation ID value to see all the logs for this get request. And the real value of using a correlation ID is that you can pass it along in a request header in a microservices setting, which is going to let you trace a particular request in a microservices system. If you want to learn more about using Seek for your structured logs, then take a look at this video next make sure to smash the like and subscribe buttons. And until next time, stay awesome.